I'm very pleased that you can be here. Um, our two speakers today are the authors of a new book called Chasing Aphrodite, The Hunt for Moon and the of the World's Richest Museum. Obviously referring to the Gettys. Uh, Jason Felch is uh, an award-winning journalist, uh, journalist uh, at the LA Times. Uh, he's written on topics such as drug trafficking, forensic DNA, disaster fraud, money laundering, public education, and corruption in the art world. And that was just last week. <laughs> Um, and Ralph Franleo uh, was, was a journalist with the LA Times for 25 years and worked and appeared in the LA Times, the New York Times, and the Journalism Review. And he's now a media consultant for various projects in Bangladesh and Nepal and Sri Lanka, where he trained working journalists on investigative reporting techniques and the rights to information law. So I'm very pleased that they can be here. As I said, their book uh, is just out, or publicly recently out. There will be a book signed tonight if you want to come. Uh, we have not set that up for this afternoon, but there is one tonight if you'd like to come and go buy the book or post the other And I will hold it at the end of the show. Will you sign it for the 10%? No, not 10%. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm very pleased to think of me here. Uh, and we need to talk about what I think are very, very important issues about museums and acquisitions um, and heritage. And obviously, the Penn Museum is very important in terms of this, in terms of setting up in 1970 the Pennsylvania Declaration. The first really large museum that said, we're not going to buy on to accept the donation of the material. So this is a suitable location for this uh, conversation here. So let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out to your presentation. Um, the other day we went out to eat at a restaurant and on the side there was a speed game going on. <laughs> so we're going to give you a little bit of a speed presentation because we want to keep it down to about 20 minutes. Uh, usually we can go on for about an hour to call it this is a very rich topic. Uh, but let's start with the Getty. Um, okay, that's a, a, a picture of the Getty uh, Villa. There are actually two Gettys. There's the Getty Villa was built in the early 70s, and then there's the, the big Getty that's on the hill that everybody knows about that uh, was built and opened in 2000. And, uh, you know, it, the Getty, of course, the namesake uh, museum for J. Paul Getty was at one point the richest man in the world, made his money in oil, and he had one weakness. He was, he was a skin flint, really. He, uh, he would go to his house in, uh, in London, uh, and he would ask to use the phone, and he'd say, right over there's a pay phone. And he, he would take down everything he ate, so he would write down the cost. He was very, very cheap. Uh, but one thing he couldn't stop doing, and that was buying art. And he, he likened it to an addiction. He says if a drug addict has uh, a monkey on his back, I have like 100 monkeys on mine. I can't stop buying art. So when he died in 76, instead of giving his money to his kids, he gave it to this museum. And it became overnight the world's richest art institution. And between 85 and 2004, it spent over $60 million acquiring Greek and Roman antiquities, which was one of the four main collections of the museum. Um, uh, 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 I'm just going to float it up to here. Uh, yeah. right. There we go. Okay. Now, $100 million of that was spent by this lady, Mary True, who in 82 joined the Yeti uh, as basically a refugee. She was a refugee from the East Coast. Uh, she, had gone, she had gone to Harvard, didn't finish her dissertation, had a very terrible marriage uh, that broke up, uh, and she had she knocked around in the art world. She wasn't able to get a museum job, so she went on the dealer side and just was not happy with it. But she's very bright, very bright, and she also had this incredible eye uh, on how to put together an exhibit. So it was very, it, it was accessible to the public. So she went to the Getty, and there she rose very, very quickly. Uh, and in 1986, she, she became the antiquities uh, curator. She was basically chosen by default. Uh, I don't know if you want, ever want to hear your boss say this, but uh, the museum director said, well, the, the, uh, the shore, the water went off the shore, and you're the only thing left on the beach <laughs> uh, when she got the job. But she proved to be quite ingenuous, uh, a, a, a very uh, genuine and smart curator. And, started building the Getty's uh, collection. And on her first trip to Europe, she met these two gentlemen, 
On the right is Robin Signs, and on the left, Krishna McLeodies. They were business partners, dealers, and lovers. Uh, Robin Signs uh, 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 greeted the Getty. He was uh, <clears throat> selling to the high end. He had started a business selling antiquities to very rich people. Of course, one of the main clients he wanted to, to uh, uh, cater to was the Getty. He, in fact, sold some things to Getty himself uh, way back when. So when she came to town, he says, I want to take you to see something. And he took her to a warehouse in the Battersea section of London, and she walked in and saw this. Seven and a half feet tall, uh, over half a ton, uh, she saw this beautiful statue of a goddess. Now, this thing is very, very significant. She noticed two things immediately. It was artistically significant. Why? It's artistically significant for a couple reasons. What's called an acrolith. An acrolith is a combination of materials. You notice the face, the arm, and uh, you can't really see it too well, but the feet are made of uh, uh, Greek marble. But the body is made of limestone. And these kind of acroliths were made in uh, Greek uh, colonies where they didn't have a lot of marble. The other thing is if you look at the folds of the dress, it's a windblown effect. And it is actually an example of the the height of Greek classical uh, uh, sculpture, uh, and it's reminiscent of the Parthenon frieze. Right? Uh, Phidias had the same kind of uh, design on the dresses there. So this was very significant, and she also realized it was authentic. But there was another thing that she could have noticed too, and she probably did. It was probably looted. Looted, why? Because here are uh, photos of the Aphrodite before it was cleaned up. She doesn't have acne there, okay? That is a rhyme. That's dirt. And uh, it, had, uh, uh, it had dirt in the folds. It had saplings in it. And as you can see here, the most telling thing uh, would be these breaks. There's a straight break there, and there's a break here, okay? And what those breaks were, um, inside the breaks, they were sharp, sharp edges, so it was recent. And they had a rind that was a lot less intense on the outside, so they were new, right? And uh, those breaks, those are the kind of breaks that are made by looters, because you know, they, don't, they don't want to cart around a seven and a half foot statue, so they break them, and they can then ship it in different pieces. So, you know, it was pretty obviously looted. Now, the Getty really wanted this piece, but this put the Getty into a quandary. Uh, the, uh, uh, her media boss was John Walsh, the Getty Museum Director, but the Getty also has a, uh, an umbrella trust over it. And so the person in charge of that was Harold Williams. And Harold Williams was a little bothered by this. He had been the former chairman of the SEC. He said, you know, uh, he was trained as a lawyer. Uh, he was a business dean at UCLA. He said, oh, bothered by this because I've been told 95% of the stuff that we get that are antiquities are recently excavated, i.e. looted. And he said, I'm a little nervous about this. And John Wall should have pushed back. And he said, look, if we don't get this, who else is going to be able to save this thing? Uh, you know, we need, to, we need to get it for posterity. We need to, we need to clean it up. We need to, to make sure that it's, it's there for uh, future generations. And they actually had a discussion about this. They had a real soul-wrenching discussion. And thank goodness, Mr. Walsh uh, took some notes. And uh, so I'll show you some of the notes from that discussion. OK, it says acquisition policy, antiquities, that September 2nd, 1987, H.W. Harold Williams. We're saying we won't look into the provenance. You know what provenance is? Everyone here familiar with that? We know it's stolen. Signs of fence. <laughs> Must we not try? Why not ask signs? <laughs> now, both of these men, when we did the story, the original story on this, said, oh, we were talk talking hypothetically. <laughs> uh, okay, but, but the, the answer was, should we ask signs? Can we ask signs? And they concluded that actually signs and all the other dealers were liars. <laughs> and they said this. They're liars. The dealers are liars. If we ask them for the provenance, they're going to lie to us. What can we do to make this look good? What can we do to, to make it right? 
And so uh, they, they came up with an idea to have a new acquisition policy. Now, the old policy for the museum said, we're not buying anything that's suspicious. If it doesn't come with a provenance, you dig, dig, dig until you find out. Uh, we're going to respect uh, you know, the laws that are evolving. But what they did is they basically carved a loophole under the guise of the new policy. And that new policy said, we're going to do two things. We're going to ask the dealers, or liars, to give us a warranty. <laughs> so if there's any, any problem with it, they'll give us our money back. <laughs> the second thing we're going to do is we're going to contact who we think are the source countries. And we're going to ask them, do you have any information about this? Now, can you figure out why that might be a problem? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Well, it's a difference. I mean, we're not talking about stolen art. Stolen art is something that's already known. It's been in a collection. There's a pho photograph. This is looted art. Looted art, nobody knows it exists, except the person who loots it out of the tomb. It's gone. Well, what record is it? So what's in Uh There's a hole here. <laughs> so it was what people in the Getty knew as something called optical due diligence. <laughs> it looks good. Okay? But what was very interesting, and the next slide will show you, is Williams was still bothered by this, and as he was talking about this, he asked the question, are we willing to buy stolen property for some higher aim? Now, first of all, to have a major museum official say this out loud is amazing. To have a man who is credited with uh, the Anti-Overseas Foreign Bribery Act to say this is just amazing, okay? Double amazing. And the answer to this question was yes. Time and again, the Getty went on to buy things that, although they didn't know specifically was stolen, they knew generally was stolen. And, uh, you know, and what happened? In uh, this case, as soon as they announced the, uh, the Aphrodite uh, acquisition, there was a huge hue and cry. You see a headline here. But that died out. It died out because Italy, even though they claimed it and they did their own investigation, they couldn't prove it. And it was the triumph of uh, innocent until proven guilty. That's how museum officials kind of looked at this. A piece is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, and so I'm going to read just a little passage from the book. Uh, part of what they were dealing with was UNESCO. Uh, you know the UNESCO report was passed in 1970, and that's when the countries of the world got together and tried to stop looting by calling on each other to cooperate through their import-export controls. They tried to take this loose net of very uneven laws and create a, a greater force. <laughs> And uh, in 1983, the U.S. adopted its uh, uh, enabling legislation for UNESCO that would allow any country to come to our country and say, we have evidence that stuff is being stolen and looted from our, our soil. Will you please make sure you don't allow this in through customs? Um, and so they were wrestling with this. But in truth, uh, UNESCO changed very little because when it came out, people said, oh, the end of piracy, it's all over. It's a paradigm shift. But not true. Except here. Yeah. <laughs> Except here. Here <laughs> at Penn, as Mr. Uh, Dr. Leventhal said, you guys took it seriously. And that's why we're very happy to be here and talk to you because you were the righteous ones. All right? <laughs> so in truth, UNESCO changed very little. For the past 40 years, museum officials have routinely violated UNESCO treaty and foreign and domestic laws by an ancient art they knew had been illegally excavated and spirited out of source countries. Their actions amounted to a massive betrayal of their public mission. To educate the public and preserve the past, white glove curators did business with the most corrupt orders of the art world. They were cutting deals in Swiss bank vaults and smugglers' warehouses with the criminal underclass who controlled the market. They bought objects laundered through auction houses and private collections, accepting and at times inventing fake ownership histories that covered criminal origins with falsehoods that to this day obscure the historical record. In doing so, museums have fueled the destruction of far more knowledge than they have preserved, all the while ostensibly deploring the havoc that looting wreaks on archaeological sites. And you know, 
they got away with it. Why would museums do this? Um, uh, why would they betray their mission and, and promote the destruction of objects when their whole purpose for being is to preserve these objects? Well, to understand that, uh, that's really the question we we're trying to answer in the book. Because when we wrote a bunch of um, investigative pieces in the Los Angeles Times, 2005 through 2007, it was a big scandal and it made headlines around the world. But the context of that scandal was missing. And so the book is an attempt to really put in that context and understand how highly educated people like Mary True and John Walsh and Harold Williams get into a position of knowingly violating um, uh, you know, and, and working against their publicly stated interests. The answer as to why uh, is, is because they thought, they, thought they thought they could get away with it. Um, they thought, on the one hand, that they were doing the right thing, that, that the right place for these things to be uh, was at the Getty Museum uh, and at the American Museum. They could protect them and conserve them and publish them and share them with the public. They thought that they uh, had a, a moral right to collect objects, and that has a long history, which we'll be talking a little bit more about tonight, in kind of the origin of museums and what their role is. They also thought they'd never get caught. And the reason they thought they'd never get caught is illustrated by the case of the Aphrodite. The Italians knew very well that this Aphrodite must have come from Italy. In fact, because it was an acrolyth, it almost certainly came from Sicily. But there was no way to prove it. And the, and the American museums for years bought these type of objects and said, we'll prove it. And the Italians couldn't prove it. What changed this whole conversation in the American museum community in particular was a police raid in 1995 in Switzerland. For years, the Italian authorities had been um, uh, catching looters, at the lowest level of the pyramid, guys digging in the soil in the middle of the night. He'd grab a few vases, he'd catch them hands dirty, they'd go to jail if they went to jail for a year or two. And that was it. It was kind of like, um, you know, in the drug trade, getting the guy selling, uh, selling on the corner, right? It's not going to stop the drug trade. What bound their hands was that they couldn't really reach the key middlemen. In the antiquities trade, the key middlemen were based mostly in Switzerland. These were guys, mostly Italian, who had come up through the trade who started off as, as low-level looters, but made good. And they moved their operations to Switzerland where the law protected them. So Switzerland is a place where for generations we've, we've uh, people have been able to take stuff and kind of wander it, and uh, it's been a big smuggling hub because of all the secrecy laws. And so uh, for the antiquities trade, this was true, in part because Switzerland's Swiss law doesn't recognize cultural patrimony. They don't have much cultural patrimony, so they didn't recognize it as a crime. Uh, the other thing was that under Swiss law, if you possessed something for five years, you took legal title to it. So you could get, in, in America, if it's stolen property, you can never possess legal title. Well, in Switzerland, you just got to pull it off in a warehouse for a few years. And then you got legal title, so you could go out into the world. So um, the dealers had moved to Switzerland, and the Italians were always frustrated because just across the border, there were these guys who were running the illicit antiquities trade. So in 1995, uh, the Italians finally got authority from the Swiss to raid the warehouse of a man named Giacomo Medici. Uh, and this is what they found. They found uh, a warehouse full of recently excavated antiquities. Uh, some of these objects had been cleaned up and restored and were ready for sale. Some of them were in the process of being restored. And others were in crates with dirt and Italian newspapers. Uh, some of these crates were uh, uh, labeled the fruits of Italy. Uh, and these literally were fruit crates full of Italian archaeological objects recently brought into the across the border into Switzerland, where they were in the process of being cleaned up for sale to museums and collectors. So this was a big this was a big nap for the Italians. This was a breakthrough moment. But what really made it a breakthrough moment was not the objects they seized, not the hundreds of objects they seized. What it was was the was the archive of photographs that Medici had kept. Giacomo Medici wasn't a big record keeper, but what he did keep was Polaroid photographs showing every object that he had sold on to middlemen and dealers over the years. It was his way of keeping track of what he'd done. And on the back, he scrolled a very simple code. You know, J. Paul Getty, uh, you know, uh, 30 million, or more like, you know, 400,000, and, um, you know, uh, just, just basic notes about where these things had gone. So the Italians found this archive, and they said, my goodness, we now have not just what Medici has in his possession, but 30 years back, this is the key middleman We've got an archive of this. Where are these things today? So they began through a very laborious process of basically it was a, a large scale game of concentration. They had an archive of thousands of, of Polaroids, 
and they had to find out where these objects had ended up. So they began to, to make matches. They got all the books of all the known collections out there. And they started to say, well, this piece kind of looks like that piece. And oh, where was this piece? I can't remember. So they started to find matches. And sure enough, they began to trace these things, um, by and large, to American museums. More than any other museum, the most objects that were traced were to the J. Paul Getty Museum, which has spent more than $100 million um, since Mary and Shrew became curator in 1986, buying uh, recently excavated antiquities. This is the Getty's um, uh, well-known statue of Apollo. Um, and here you see the Apollo soon after it came out of the ground. This is the Medici Bowler. So you see it on a packing crate with dirt in pieces. Here you can see it's just basically just resting the next it has its growing line, it's covered in dirt. This is what the statue looked like right after it came out of the ground. This is the Gettys famous um, statue of griffins attacking a fallen dome. This is an incredible Greek sculpture found in, in southern Italy. And um, it still has, you see here, the original polychrome. This painting, most Greek uh, marbles was vividly painted in. And most of the reasons, most of the marbles we see today are all white. But the painting has been lost. But this preserves incredible amounts of its original polychrome. And uh, is really a dramatic scene, so dramatic we put it on the cover of the book. Well, here you see the griffins in the trunk of the car in pieces. Um, the Italians were able to figure out that the license plate on the car was an Italian license plate. And here um, you see a chunk of the griffins sitting on what is an Italian piece of newspaper. So again, images of the griffins very soon after they came out of the tomb in southern Italy. Um, these images were really all that the Italians needed uh, to, to prove that these objects had been looted. This was the smoking gun that had always been missing for the Italian government. And so they began to really do this broad and deep investigation of the antiquities trade. And uh, one of the things they found that really guided them was this organizational chart here. Uh, this was captured in the possession of a man who was uh, essentially an Italian IRS agent who had been hunted and was part of the incident antiquities trade. He was a middleman. And he died in a car crash, and Italian authorities go over to his house, and they open up a drawer, and they find this diagram. And this diagram is essentially an org chart of the um, illicit antiquities trade in Italy. What you have all along the bottom here are Elio and Manetti and all these gentlemen here are diggers. They're all across the boot of Italy in the fields at night finding objects. Now they're filtering their objects up to two middlemen. We've got here John Franco Bacchina. Bacchina uh, was, was essentially um, the clearinghouse for objects found really in the southern half of Italy. And his competitor and um, uh, the man in charge of the northern half was this man, Giacomo Medici, whose name is over here. Uh, Medici was really from Rome north. He, is, he specialized in Etruscan objects. He was from uh, the area around Trevetri, uh, where the famous Euphronius crater was from. In fact, he was the one who got the Euphronius crater to the Met. Um, so here's Medici. Well, both of these men are funneling their objects to a man named Robert Hecht. Robert Hecht is a well-known name if you uh, have been reading about these things. Because really, for 50 years, really since World War II, he has been the linchpin of the illicit antiquities trade, particularly out of objects um, in Italy. I should say allegedly, uh, because he's currently on trial in Rome. Um, he's uh, accused of his role in this conspiracy. Um, but we're expecting those charges to expire, the statute of limitations on those charges to expire sometime next month. And most likely, he will get off. And so uh, he's, not, he's never been convicted. Um, although he's happy to tell stories about his life in the trade. Um, uh, where is Hecht sending his objects to? Well, you see Paris and USA, and in the USA you say, you see in Italian, musei, museums, and collectionisti, collectors. So this is it. This is the org chart of the eluded antiquities trade. So the Italians use this, and after a very lengthy, detailed investigation, they start to go to American museums and say, you've got our stuff, and you got it illicitly, and we want it back. And when they went to the Getty, which is one of the first people they went to, because that's where most of the objects were, um, you know, the Getty was obviously concerned and, and quickly hired an outside attorney named uh, Dick Martin, uh, who had formerly worked at the U.S. Embassy in, um, uh, in Italy, in Rome. And his actual role there was processing these uh, legal requests. When, when a country like Italy wants to invest something, uh, investigate something in the U.S., you have to file this kind of cumbersome legal procedure called an MLAT. Well, Martin had been processing MLATs in the embassy. So he knew the system, and he had actually processed some of the MLATs in the early stage of this case. Now he's a private attorney, and he, he's representing the Getty. 
defending the Getty from these charges. So Dick Martin and other attorneys say, well, let's look into the Getty's files and see what we find. He'd flown to Rome, he'd met with the uh, Italian prosecutor, and he said, we are not the bad guys in this situation. We will help you, we'll have you cooperate, we'll share with you everything we find. Um, let us just do some looking around in our own files. Well, when they looked into their own files, they found a lot of troubling documents that basically revealed the Getty's own history of buying looted antiquities. And it appeared clear uh, from this internal investigation that there was lots of evidence, Getty officials knew exactly what they were doing when they were buying this that they knew they were buying their antiquities. The org chart that Dick Martin's team made up looks like this. At the top is the Guinea Museum, Templesman and Fleischman, that's Barbara and Lawrence Fleischman, New York collectors. This is Maurice Templesman, Jackie O's former companion, diamond magnate, big New York um, collector. Um, where are they getting their things from? Robin Symes, the man who sold the uh, Aphrodite. Robert Hecht, uh, the middleman we spoke about. And they're connected to the Italian middleman, Giacomo Medici. Uh, Nicholas Kudalakis is not Italian, John Franco Bikina at the Kunz Palladian Gallery. And where are they getting their objects from? Clearly the Getty's own attorneys concluded that this stuff was coming from Italy. So when you put these things together, what you see is the full picture. When you, when you couple the, the Italian investigation and the, and the Getty investigation, which is what we did in our news articles in 2006 and 7, you see the full picture of the trade. From the tombs and ruins of Italy to the J. Paul Getty Museum. This was, uh, this resulted in, in 2005, the indictment, the criminal indictment by Italy of uh, Getty curator Marion True. Um, this photograph uh, probably did more to change the collecting practices of American museums than any uh, legal development, than any, uh, uh, I hate to say it, academic conference. Um, this changed practices. Because when American museum officials realized that they could be put in handcuffs and walk through a crowd of paparazzi to trial. I'm sorry, she's not in handcuffs there. Um, it, this sends a very clear message. This was all you really needed to know. Uh, oh boy, we could get caught. Uh, this is her uh, criminal indictment, as you can see. Her co-defendants co in this case were uh, Giacomo Medici and Robert Hecht. Um, the focus of the Italian investigation came to fall on the Getty. One, because most of the objects landed there, and two, because um, they really, uh, in, in part, I think our, our, our access to inside documents really kind of sewed the whole case together. But the Getty was by no means alone. The Getty was a case study for what was going on at American museums all around the country. Museums, with the exception of this one, uh, that were collecting ancient art at, at one level or another all had ties with this illicit trade. And this came to light as the Italian investigation began to began to follow these Polaroids. So um, the effects of this uh, were the scandal were enormous, not just in the return of these objects. You'll see the number of objects returned. Um, this is a process that I should say that is still ongoing. The Italians are still in the midst of um, uh, following the threads of this investigation. They've essentially completed the Medici case. But remember the other guy in the chart, John Franco Bikina? Well, he's next. And his archive is 10 times the size of Medici. And that has just begun to play out. We're just starting to see the hints of that. And so these numbers are going to grow, and there are other museums who are going to be um, uh, confronted with the decision of whether to return things. Uh, the the givebacks there uh, amount to about a billion dollars worth of art that the museum's lost and they weren't to repay The one object that there wasn't a Polaroid of was the Aphrodite. Uh, Medici actually had a hand in this one. And so we didn't have any polar pictures of it. So in 2007, Ralph and I set out um, he to Switzerland, we to Sicily, to see what we could find out about where the Aphrodite had been found. Um, well, what we found was that the Getty had ignored um, uh, lots of warnings when buying the object, and lots of clear signs that it had been recently looted. And when um, Ralph went to Switzerland, he uh, spoke with the alleged former owner of the statue. This is the man who the Getty said was the original owner had it in his family since 1939. Well, he wouldn't speak to Ralph, but when Ralph went and spoke to his, his brother and his sister and his niece and his nephew, um, Ralph said, look, the, the story is that you guys have had this in your family since the 30s, and that it was in the basement of your house. And they all got a real laugh. <laughs> they said, well, if this had been in the basement of my house, I wouldn't be working here in this little tobacco shop. <laughs> um, so that quickly fell away as that was the cover story. Uh, in Sicily, what I found was 
um, some shady gentlemen who were involved in the antiquities trade who said that they'd actually seen the Aphrodite in the late 1970s, very soon after it came out of the ground. And they remembered her face because it's an iconic face, this marble goddess, and that they could um, name the other objects that had been found with her. And one of them told the story of how the statue had been broken on purpose by the, by the smugglers so that it could be transported easily and put into the back of a carrot truck and driven to Switzerland, where it was cleaned and pieced back together. So the story of the Aphrodite didn't come out of Coleridge, it came through some shoe leather reporting. Um, uh, and it also came out, I think the linchpin of it was probably um, in um, 2006, when the Getty hired its own private investigators to do essentially what we had been doing. And uh, the first person they went to go visit was this uh, gentleman uh, who supposedly had it in his family since 1939. Well, the Getty had been told a decade earlier uh, had actually been written a letter a decade earlier by this guy. He said, I was the guy who owned your famous statue of Aphrodite, and I have some information about its origins, and I'd like to share them with you. And I have some lovely pictures of it, too, before it was restored. Would you like to see these? And this letter arrived in Harold Williams' desk, and Williams said, oh, geez, what do we do with this? He gave it to Walsh, and Walsh had given it to Marion True. And the Getty to concluded, we don't want to talk to this guy. We don't want to know where this thing came from. Let's ignore it. And so they ignored it. Well, now the Getty, uh, under a lot of pressure from Italy and from the newspapers, was um, suddenly very interested in where this thing had come from. So they sent some private investigators to go talk to this guy, and this guy had pictures. Pictures that were, in some ways, very similar to the Medici Polaroids. They showed the Aphrodite pre-restoration, basically spilling out of a bag of dirt. Uh, all in pieces, um, sitting on a kind of a, a cement floor in a very unflattering uh, situation, along next to piles of dirt with all kinds of crumbling pieces of it falling off. This is the object most likely soon after it had been kind of dumped out of the bag it was being transported in onto the floor of some basement in Switzerland where it would begin to be pieced back together. So again, you finally have evidence that it had been missing for really since 1988 uh, where this thing came from. Uh, with such compelling evidence, the Getty was forced to return the Aphrodite. Here are pictures of it um, being packed up and shipped back to Sicily. Um, as you can see, here you see these nice clean breaks. Uh, and this is actually the statue being mounted by Getty Museum experts in a museum in Sicily. This statue was returned to uh, uh, an archaeological site called Morgantina. It's right in the middle of Sicily. It's a very important ancient Greek city. And it's where a lot of the things that ended up in American museums came from. So the Mets, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Morgantina Silvers, this incredible silver set, came from this site. Uh, this Aphrodite came from this site. Um, here we are in front of the Aphrodite on her new uh, display. She's got a room to herself. It's a Capuchin monastery, a 17th century Capuchin monastery in a very small little hill town in central Sicily. Um, it's for you all to debate whether this is the right place for this statue. Um, at the Getty, uh, 400,000 people a year would see her. In this little Capuchin monastery, well, before the Aphrodite arrived, they were happy if they saw um, a few hundred visitors a year. Yeah, what we hear is that since, since the Aphrodite's return, that number has gone up exponentially. And suddenly, Italy and all the politicians of Italy are saying, let's make this a cultural hub, a cultural tourism hub, and, and be a kind of a developmental project for this very poor region of Italy. And, and, and use this to kind of um, invest in our communities. Um, there's a somewhat happy ending to the story, which is that um, a byproduct of this very painful scandal that made museums look very bad and that really cost the career and reputation of Mary True, a woman many people in uh, this field really respected a lot. Um, the byproduct has been a new era for museums. It's an era that Mary True herself articulated um, later in her career and really advocated for and fought for. And the irony is that it really only came about thanks to her own downfall. It's an era where museums are beginning to move beyond ownership, where they're beginning to say that, gee whiz, Italy has thousands of these objects, incredible objects, in their storerooms, in their basements, on display in museums that are never visited. Could they lend those to us, and that way we can satisfy our need for new objects instead of relying on the illicit trade? It's these type of cultural collaboration agreements that have been the byproduct of the scandal. And here are a few objects that have, that have gone to the Getty now, in many cases for the first time ever leaving Italy, that are really remarkable pieces of ancient art. Uh, this is an, uh, an Etruscan bronze 
Um, uh, it's called the Chimera of Arezzo. It's a remarkable figure. It's very large. And it's just a stunning work of art. This had never left Italy before. Um, this is Nefebe. This is a, a, a youth from uh, Mozia. These, I'm sorry, that's not the Mozia youth. That's a different one. Um, these are remarkable pieces of ancient art that have come to the Getty without having to break any laws, without having to spend any money, and they stay for a few years. They're conserved. The Getty has some of the best experts in the world at earthquake protection and, and, and mounting these things on seismic proof mounts. They're getting new mounts, they're getting cleaned, they're getting studied, and then they go home and new things come. This is the future. It's the future if we don't fall back into our old ways. So the question is, is the age of piracy really over? Well, there have been some indications since the Getty scandal that the age of piracy may not quite be over yet. Here in the middle, you see Michael Govan. He's the director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It's an encyclopedic museum. It collects ancient art, among many other areas. He's asking federal authorities if he can get into his own museum. <laughs> Why? Well, because in January 2001, more than 100 federal agents raided Black and said, we're here to look for looted Southeast Asian antiquities. An undercover investigator for five years had penetrated an alleged smuggling network that was bringing Southeast Asian uh, uh, ancient art, uh, some of it from a World Heritage site um, uh, in Thailand, uh, through uh, a smuggling network into Anaheim, California, in a big warehouse. And these objects were being donated with inflated appraisals to museums in Southern California. This alleged smuggling network was happening at the very same time that Getty was making headlines for getting busted in the illicit antiquities trade. So it was January 2008. January 2008. Sorry. Um, and it was one of our curators who was the expert witness for the investigation. Joyce White. Yes. <laughs> um, Joyce and others who are part of this investigation are frustrated because this was in January 2008, and the feds had been doing an undercover investigation for five years. And if you believe the search warrant affidavits that were executed as a, as a way to go into these museums, it's an incredible story that indicates that museum officials were complicit in this, not just looted antiquities scheme, but a tax fraud scheme that went along with it. Inflated appraisals, the museum gets the objects, the donor gets an inflated write-off, and the looter gets to move all this material. Um, there have been no indictments in this since 2008. There's been no news in this since 2008. And once a month we call the, the, the US Attorney's Office in LA and we say, what the hell are you guys doing? What, what's up with this case? And the answer is complicated. Um, just quickly, this is Michael Padgett. Dr. Michael Padgett is the curator of antiquities at the Princeton Art Museum. The Princeton Art Museum struck a deal with Italy in 2007, and uh, the, the culture minister of Italy came forward and said, you know, uh, we welcome a future collaboration with Princeton, and uh, the then director of the Princeton Museum came forward and said, we're moving beyond ownership, the system of loans is going to change everything, we're so happy to resolve our differences. Eight objects, uh, the title for eight objects went back to Italy and everything appeared to be fine until June of last year when uh, the New York Times broke the story that Michael Padgett was the subject of an investigation of an alleged conspiracy involving looted antiquities that continued, if you believe the allegations, through to 2006. So this is a pending case. There have been no indictments. Dr. Padgett um, is, uh, you know, maintains his innocence and uh, and we'll see what comes of this. Another indication, though, that the age of pirates is going to not be over. This was just this year. In June, um, uh, this is, is it John Lewis the third. He's a collector of ancient Egyptian art. Uh, he got served a search warrant by federal agents, along with three antiquities dealers, for allegedly trafficking in recently looted Egyptian antiquities that were being laundered in Bahrain and brought into New York and distributed to dealers and collectors. Uh, Mr. Lewis has, just, has donated a lot of his ancient Egyptian objects to museums around the country. And, and now people like ourselves and bloggers and other people are trying to find out where the trails of this one leads. Again, no indictments yet, search warrant affidavits, so we don't know the full story here, and these guys haven't presented their side. Um, but but it, there are indications that this thing could still go either way. The age of piracy is not completely over yet. And we have a model, what we do have as a result of the Getty scandal, is a model of the way we move forward. <coughs> the Getty has now finally adopted the approach that Penn adopted back in 1970, 
which is to draw a very bright line and say, if we can't prove that it was out of its country of origin after 1970, we're not going to buy it. Um, that, uh, the Getty's move to adopt that led to the American Museum Directors Association to adopt it is now the de facto policy of most American collecting museums. Um, the question is, is that going to win the day? So we put it to you as students and professors and, and people involved in this and interested in it. Um, it's up to you to make sure that this goes in the right direction. We have now a model to move away from a practice that's been going on for really centuries. Um, but we also have the, the potential to fall back into our old ways. Um, thank you very much uh, for having us today. Um, we'd love to have a great conversation about this. You can follow um, updates and further stories about, uh, about the book at ChasingAfroDating.com. You can also order the book there. <laughs>
do, but what about other collectors that well, Joseph, need some Joseph, public pressure? Put Joseph on and them? Lewis, who we just had up there, is an example of one. I, I think there are some um, uh, systemic challenges to investigating collectors and, and, and using, I mean, if you look over the Getty, uh, over the story of the Getty, uh, what, and, and more broadly the museum community, what really made the change happen wasn't changes in the law, it wasn't changes in policy or, or uh, conferences, it was, it was um, uh, public relations, it was humiliation in, 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 in the eyes of the public. It made me shame. Yeah, um, uh, which is what our job is. Um, and that's what made things move at the Getty. And so um, uh, private individuals are less susceptible to that kind of pressure than big public institutions. You also don't have um, access to their records. I mean, we were able to cultivate sources at the Getty who basically opened up the Getty's files to us and said, you know, have that access. And um, it's hard to find to convince Shelley White to disclose her, her, her personal collecting files. Um, and so it's just hard enough to crack, I think. But it's an important link in the chain and, and one that I think deserves attention. This is a very clear comment. Um, you're being very optimistic that the, the age of, of, of museums and purchasing of activities is over or coming to the close. And you know, I think one of the critical pieces that you see is that you're really only talking about recently. Right. Mm -hmm. You're really only talking about <clears throat> the results of Medici um, uh, seizure of the archives and then hopefully the next archive. But we also know about the destruction around the world of all the other cultures in all the other countries in the world where the stuff's going on, whether that's Mexico or Peru or Bolivia or Mali. And, the, and in some sense, none of that's happening with any of these other countries. So it's only with really two countries. Not really happening with Egypt, barely happening with Turkey, and that's it. And my worry in some sense is to say we're going we're to need to lull back in the sense, oh, we're, we're taking care of this. And in fact, we know that the destruction is happening around the world. And in fact, these museums are only going to come back because there's irrefutable evidence that they bought the wrong stuff. And we need that kind of evidence. That's the special but as you said, good is hard to get them sold. And that there is that problem. So I think we have to be, I would be more cautious because I'm not as optimistic about that. I do have a question. When Harold Williams writes about the higher aim, will we accept small object for, for, the, for the higher aim? Model? What is that higher aim? To preserve the object as this little lost object? Or is it really to preserve cultural heritage, the, the sites? And the historic and prehistoric sites on the ground, and purchasing that doesn't save them. It might protect that one option. Is that, was that the, the, the aim that he was talking about? Um, his, his question actually echoes something that um, is, a, is a doctrine that came out of the British Museum, and we call it um, cultural colonialism. And that is, uh, we've got to save the art from the natives. Uh, and there's this notion that uh, there are these orphans floating out there as orphan pieces, and if we don't buy them, uh, they're going to go into some private collection or somebody's going to pay a hammer to them or something like that. We're going to save them. The uh, fact of the matter is they're not orphans. They're, they're fruits of an illicit trade. And uh, uh, his higher aim was to preserve it for, for posterity. I mean, that's always been the, the trump card. You know? I mean, you just don't understand. I mean, we're, we're future generations. And so that, that higher aim was served. Um, and also, there was an aim of Getty to make a name for itself. It was a very young institution, it had to catch up real fast. And, uh, you know, one fit with the other. But I, I think this higher aim was not to preserve archaeological sites, because it wouldn't be buying stuff like that. This um, higher aim was to preserve the intrinsic beauty. And as Clemency Cogs once said, it's beautiful, but it's also dumb. It doesn't tell you anything. If you strip it from its archaeological context, as you very well know. I mean, if you take it out of archaeological context, you don't know who used it, who made it, why it was, you know, why it was used, was it in a ceremony? It doesn't tell you anything about the people who created it. It's just an intrinsic beauty. And uh, museum um, officials uh, tended to, to be that way. Um, Dietrich von Bachner, who was the Greek and Roman um, uh, curator at the, at the Met, I think to get to your other issue, just to follow up a little bit, um, I think you're right that we're optimistic or that uh, 
bit, we're a bit optimistic on this, and that you make important points that uh, in our longer version presentation, we, we know that there's that this is really not a problem that's been solved. What's, what is hopeful, though, about this is that finally I think we have a way forward in this in the this notion of loans replacing acquisitions has been articulated a few times in, in, in at different conferences and such. But we've really now, because of the scandal, seen it take hold, and it's in place for some major collecting institutions as the way forward. So it's not that the problem is solved, but it's finally that we see a path forward. And if this works for the Met and the Getty, and they're able to, you know, meet their mission and, and educate people about ancient art without relying on illicit trade. Hopefully that can serve as a kind of a lesson for collecting institutions that collect Greek Columbia or Southeast Asia or Near Eastern that are facing these same dilemmas today. This is a way forward for them. So our hope is that it's a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. Museums, though, um, in the strictest sense, are not looking at the, um, the cultural heritage. They're looking at the aesthetic. But uh, another comment is, is that this is theft of, of just gigantic proportions. I don't think it's just looting. You know, you, you hear from Sims, the uh, consumer is the best consumer. Well, I think the best educated thief is the most educated thief. And for Mary and Drew to have done this, but I think the culture of the time allowed her to do it. Um, I've known theft of pre-Columbian things since the 70s, and it's still going on. And it was largely done by collectors. It's brought as textiles in New York in the 70s, where you would see these people um, being mentioned in the Times, and nothing was ever really done. Um, I don't know if, if just, uh, you, you're not going to go and look at collectors. They're not going to let them in. Uh, maybe the curator that deals with the collection will give you that. My question, though, to you is the whole area of, of journalism. You're investigative reporters. You work for a, for a, uh, a newspaper that's bankrupt. A lot of newspapers are bankrupt. Um, you find that um, you are there to receive information, and how did you actually, I know you mentioned something about your boss when you went in, told you he wanted you to look at the Getty for um, why this person had Muniz and why he had resigned. But how then do you take that whole process? What, you know, in the years that you had to take, what? How did you get to these people that relinquish all of these archives when they get to you? Did you smile? <laughs> what, what allowed that to happen? Uh, just to go back to your point about newspapers, uh, Ralph and I both thought several times that just in the way that the newspaper industry has changed from 2005 and 6 when we started on this project to today, we wouldn't be allowed to do this story like we did. Not because anybody would be shy about taking on the powerful Getty Museum in LA, because of the resources, well, Ralph and I flew to Italy several times. We flew to Greece, Switzerland. You know, we've traveled around the world for this story, and we spent months and months and months and months before we published anything. And we wrote this story over three years. Um, investigative reporting like that is uh, uh, possible in fewer and fewer newspapers, and it's a structural problem. And the newspaper is that. And, it, and you know, I think one of the takeaways is you can't wait for investigative report. Like other, you know, academics don't like to pick fights. Well. Like the, they like to pick academic fights. But other people need to fill in on that. And, and part of what we're trying to do as we move on, especially we're both moving on, is to empower other people to ask these kind of questions, to get these kind of documents, to demand the answers of museums. Um, because these are these should these are institutions that operate for us on our behalf. And we should demand them and hold that, that they answer our questions and, and be held accountable. It's not something we're gonna be able to do for a while longer. Um, so we need other people to in that role. Um, as, as to how, uh, I mean, do you want to talk about uh, source cultivation? Well, uh, usually there are um, hidden agendas involved. Uh, people who are mad at other people, maybe even, or something some slight in the past. You try to gauge the value of the, uh, uh, value of the material uh, against that. But what we what we found was um, people were really bothered by this. They were bothered ethically and morally by what the museum was doing. There are some altruistic people out there, and they really wanted to set it straight. When Mary True was indicted, nobody could believe it. They thought the Italians were nuts, and they were they were kind of framed that way by the getting our first couple of conversations. They don't know what they're doing. The Italian law is crazy. They'll indict you. 
spinning on the sidewalk, whatever it is, you know. But once we started to look at the case, we realized it was based on some good stuff, like those, those photographs. And um, I think what, what value of our stories did through our sources was to undercut any kind of uh, really legitimate defense that we get now. We didn't know, uh, you know, who, you know who, this was an accident, whatever you want to say. It, it showed a very purposeful um, set of behaviors over the years. Those, you cannot help look at those notes and say they knew what they were doing. Are you willing to buy stolen property for some irony? You just don't theorize that. Okay. Um, I think I'm getting a little bit off the question. But uh, as a journalist, I can tell you that very few stories like this come along. And this, for me, was like, I had another story like this before, twice in a lifetime story where people were just the synchronicity of everything comes together. And we were able to get access to these documents. It took us a while to understand the subject. I mean, I'm not an expert on cultural patrimony. I'm, not, I'm going to be speaking to law school. I'm shaking my boots. I don't know much about <laughs> the law, you know. But I know about journalism, and I know how to ask questions. And that's, by the way, something that people in the museum world do not like. <laughs> they don't like people outside the academy to question their judgment. And we, uh, part of the resistance we came up against was attitude. Who are you? The question is, what do you know? And I think the value of what our stories did and what we hope the book does is to take this argument that's been going on and on within the academic community, in sort of a, uh, uh, sort of in its own little sphere, and break it out into the public, uh, so that people who go to museums, people who are intelligent. People who uh, have taken a course here or there on art will understand the process of how museums acquire things. It. Since we were little kids, we were brought to museums. I remember going to the Detroit Institute of Arts and being very excited. You know, I was going to go see all this art, and you're in awe of museums. <coughs> but there is a dirty reality behind it sometimes. Just like the steroids and baseball and other wild priests in the Catholic Church. <laughs> And uh, I think what we try to do is make it, popularize it in a way that we can explain it to people, show how these things came about, and through the Aphrodite story, make that link all the way through the chain so that they could um, understand. Because museums, they rely on public goodwill. They need people to come in through the doors. They need people to feel good about them, and they need donors to feel good. So once you start telling the dirty little secrets, you're threatening the very base uh, of popularity and even funding. Because who then, if you're a dirty museum, who wants to give money? I don't want to be tainted by that. And look at what's happened with Shelby White at New York University. She's endowed a, a new institute there. That was a huge brouhaha. And will continue to be a huge brouhaha. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs>